So you want to go viral with your posts, right? You want the world to know what you're doing. You want to push your brand. Welcome back to the Push Forward podcast. I'm your host, Alex. And today we're going to talk about the fascinating world of viral content and the psychology behind it. But before we do, let's talk about some of the data. Approximately 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are created every day. That is to say, when you are creating your posts, your emails, your videos online, you are competing with an obscene amount of data, which means it becomes harder and harder to get noticed. Just on Facebook, there are over 500,000 comments a day. Twitter, over 500 million tweets per day. That's a lot of tweets. And 95 million photos and videos are shared daily on Instagram. If you look at emails, it gets even uh, more competitive, more than 300 billion, that's correct, billion, 300 billion emails are sent daily. Just consider the fact that there are only 8 billion people in the world, but 300 billion emails are sent daily. So don't feel so bad if your open rate and click-through rate isn't that good. It's because we're being bombarded from every angle. Now, YouTube, um, it's estimated that over 500 hours of video content are created every minute. And I know that that, that actual piece of data is wrong because I was sharing that, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. So it's got to be like a thousand hours of video content are created and shared every minute and, and certainly uh, per day, even more. And then if you look at Google's own search data, so this just is for Google, they, according to Google, they process more than 8.5 billion searches per day. So these figures, what they do is highlight the immense and ever-growing volume of data being shared daily on the internet. And so what does that mean for you? Well, what it means is that while you can study the science of making content viral, it is not an exact uh, strategy or tactic, right? Sometimes you just get lucky. Take the case of the, the solo stove brand, that uh, last year in November, Snoop Dogg did a video that went viral where he talked about quitting smoking. Well, and, and I heard this from friends that reached out to me and, and they were fascinated by this post because Snoop Dogg said he quit smoking. And really what it was at the end of the video was him promoting uh, a solo stove, which is a um, smokeless fire pit. Uh, on average, they cost about $500. But in that case, even when you have a super celebrity with a large following and they had tens of millions of engagements with the post, even though it went viral, it didn't hit its mark. Why? Because the goal, the objective of the campaign from Solo Stove was to sell more Solo Stoves, sell more units, but they fell short and they fell short by a lot. So, you know, the CEO actually ended up getting fired because the campaign did so poorly. So even in cases where you have a celebrity that can do this and, and get you to get all the eyeballs on your product or service, it doesn't mean that it's going to actually sell the product. So you got to keep that in mind. And as you scroll through social media, you might stumble upon a video that evokes that unexpected burst of laughter or, uh, or, or maybe it's a nonprofit do, you know, who is kind of pulling at the heartstrings, but hit that share button, you uh, maybe add an emoji, um, perhaps you, you, you make a comment, right? But what exactly makes content go viral? Let's un unravel the psychological underpinnings here. At the heart of virality lies the power of emotions, okay? And then content that elicits strong emotional responses, whether it's amusement, surprise, outrage, or inspiration, has a higher likelihood of being shared. Why? Because emotions drive action. They compel us to react, whether it's by hitting the share button or tagging a friend in the comments. Take the viral sensation of Baby Yoda memes, for instance. The adorable and relatable character from The Mandalorian, that from that series, they instantly capture the hearts of millions by sparking that frenzy um, when they, when people share the meme around the internet, right? So there's something there that, well, also people are emotionally connected to that piece of content. 
But it's not just about emotions, in my opinion. I think social currency also plays a crucial role in the virality equation. And and people that share content that enhances their image uh, or status among their peers, they, they do this understanding what their audience, what the if it's a podcast, it's listeners. If it's on YouTube, the the viewer. If it's a blog, it's the reader, right? Um, they know what is thought provoking. They know what what is jaw dropping. But what you'll notice and realize, even with influencers that have our, I'm talking the mega with hundreds of millions of followers, that not every post actually goes viral, right? They could still have that captive audience, but sometimes as low as 10% I've seen um, with many of these, like the top influencers, like a Cristiano Ronaldo or one of those, they could put out a post that gets 10x what the one before did. Because, you know, even if you have the audience, it's not always going to be a big hit. And ultimately, on the other end, when you're thinking about creating a post that you want to go viral, you want to know did it make them feel knowledgeable? So think about like a lot of stuff that we see on a lot of content that we see on TikTok or YouTube where people are teaching someone something, right? So do they feel knowledgeable? Also, is it culturally savvy? So it needs to reflect positively in themselves, right? So that's the currency that will strengthen the connection with others. Now, let's explore some noteworthy case studies that illustrate these psychological principles in action. If you go back to early 2010s, I believe it was 2011 or 12, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. It swept across social media like wildfire. I remember I was in New York City um, at the time that the Ice Bucket Challenge was happening and there were people in the park and all over doing it, right? Celebrities were doing it, your neighbors, your coworkers, they were dumping ice cold water uh, to raise awareness and funds. Okay. Now it was great for ALS, for research, for awareness, but what made this campaign so successful? Well, it tapped into the power of empathy and solidarity, compelling participants to join the movement and share experiences with others. Now here's the deal. Here we are more than what, 12 years later, no other nonprofit organization or NGO and just, you know, Take the numbers. There are over one and a half million nonprofits in the U.S. doing a lot of great, important things for animals, for elderly, for children, lots of different causes. No organization has been able to replicate the the success that the Ice Bucket Challenge had. So what I say is this: lots of non lots of nonprofits with great CMOs and great agencies and creatives have built campaigns to to have that same virality and none have done, right? So it gets you to think about the fact that even when you try to use the same tactics from, you know, a previous campaign's playbook, it may not work because it's a moment in time in the internet where people are willing to, you know, jump on the bandwagon. Now, another standout for me is the example with the Dove Real Beauty campaign. It challenges narrow beauty standards and celebrating and it celebrates diversity so dove struck a chord with its audiences worldwide i remember when my my wife actually turned me on to this campaign i just was blown away what what they were doing and the campaign's poignant messages and powerful visuals not only resonated with viewers but also empowered them to redefine beauty on their own terms and as a result the content was widely shared, sparking beautiful, meaningful conversations and driving real positive social change. Now, I believe for Dove, the brand, what it did was it made people, shoppers, right? Consumers, when they're at the store or online shopping for similar products, give them a, a, a second thought. And it did for me, certainly. When I am going up and down the store and I see a, a Dove product, I'm more likely to purchase because that social cause is is something that I think is really important and I feel that the company is doing something bigger than than what they are so it's and it's authentic right now how can you leverage these insights to create shareable content on your own it's hard right but you got to start with understanding your audience and then what moves them emotionally take time to listen to observe 
and engage your community to uncover their passions, pain points, and preferences. When you have this knowledge, you put it all together, and it takes time. I get it. You may be using a, a poll, uh, maybe a giveaway, a survey monkey through via email, right? But once you have all that information, you're going to be able to tailor your content to evoke the desired emotional responses. And whether it's through storytelling, humor, or, or authenticity, you are likely to get better results. Take the example of the Stanley Cup craze that that uh, started last year. You know, the Stanley Cups, I mean, Stanley as a company, they've been around for since 1909, so over 100 years. At the height of their company, their revenue was about $75 million. Think about it. So for over 100 years, a company gets to a point where they're doing $75 million in revenue. But all that time, there were great marketing minds working on the brand, uh, doing campaigns that were somewhat effective, selling at retail, wholesale, online, and direct to consumer. But no one in the company ever stopped to think that, hey, maybe there's a bigger target audience that we're missing out on because they were really targeting um, workers, blue collar workers, right? Who who need a durable cup, a durable therm thermos. And um, the the buyer group, three ladies that had uh, Instagram channel and also a newsletter, they decided that they wanted to um, work with Stanley to create a series, right, of of uh, mugs, cups that were geared towards their audience, to women. So certain colors and um, designs that were more feminine. And so they they bought about uh, a lot with 5,000 cups that were specific and they started to give it to some of their followers. And before you knew it, it just spread like wildfire. And the virality there was for multiple reasons. Well, one was the power of storytelling. So if you look at the Instagram post and and some of the articles that they get picked up on as well. So there was a lot of good PR used in this campaign and they already had a, 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 a brand that was respected with, with the sort of the, the buyer guide, right? It just, everything lined up at the right time, right? And so um, the cups were selling from $40 to sometimes you could find it on eBay special collections for hundreds of dollars. They were being sold out at Target everywhere. And the company in the period of like four years went from 75 million in revenue to 750 million in revenue. And that's reported by the company. So that's a 10 X growth in a period of four years. Whereas for the last hundred years, it took them, um, you know, they, they, they never were able to penetrate this other market of women. So again, in, in this case, it wasn't a celebrity group that made the, uh, uh, cups, go viral. It was user generated content. If you look at TikTok, if you look at Instagram and analyze the Stanley Cup craze and the, all the hashtags that went along with it, the, this was very much a, a grassroots effort. And everybody that was buying it was so happy with the cup that they wanted to be a part of this, you know? And so it, it worked very well. And sometimes you don't need a celebrity because in the case of Snoop Dogg with uh, Solo Stove, it didn't work. The objective was to sell more uh, units of Solo Stove and they didn't happen. Whereas on, on, in the case of Stanley Cup, not only did they, you know, grow the, the, the revenue of the brand 10X, they, they became a household name with an entirely new audience. So now the company is able to upsell and do so much more um, by partnering with a, a group of influencers, creators that were already, um, that, that already had buy-in from, from their audience. Right. And I think that's very important. Whatever it is that you're selling, if you are selling e-commerce or you're selling B2B services, it's not enough to just create content yourself and pay other influencers to push it. It's just important that you choose the 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 influencers and creators that actually align well with your brand and then of course not be afraid to choose an influencer or creator that has an an audience that doesn't 
currently fit into your avatars, into the personas, right? Because I think Stanley Cup illustrates that. We as marketers, we as business owners sometimes can stand in our way and say, hey, marketing person, do not target this group or this channel because I don't think my buyer is there. And this really underscores the need for us as marketers, as influencers, as business owners, entrepreneurs. It underscores the the absolute importance of testing. Always be testing. You have to test. You don't know what you don't know. And, you know, it could be a channel like Reddit or Snap um, or Quora, any channel, Rumble, that maybe not the obvious social media platforms like Pinterest, um, it, it seems everyone is always after, of course, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, and then come everybody else. But sometimes there may be an audience in a specific channel that that is secondary to your product, right? And if you don't, if you weren't to, te- if you were not, if you don't give it a chance and test with a new audience, you may never find out. So that's my takeaway from this. In terms of what makes it viral, we've analyzed with um, some uh, some research studies from Rival IQ uh, to Hootsuite to Buffer. We've used uh, Influencer Marketing Hub. Lots of like amazing studies and looked at what like what are the elements and variables that that all of these viral campaigns have in common. If you set aside the celebrities, like absolutely take out the mega influencers out of the equation, um, there there isn't specifically one thing that makes viral campaigns viral, right? Other than the the obvious that I mentioned at the top of the the this episode, which is emotion. You have to connect with people emotionally, and if you can make them feel the, the 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 your sense of let's say authenticity, like Dove did with their campaign, um, but they weren't selling anything, so that's the thing too. Whereas with Solo Stove, it was very clear that once you click through to the campaign, they were trying to sell you a product. So there is an indirect and a direct way of selling your product right? And there's marketing qualified leads and sales qualified leads. I think often, you know, for, for marketers and brands, we try to go directly down to the bottom of the funnel and say, here's the offer. Here's the discount. Here's a, a, a you know, a social media um, superstar or influencer who, who says they like our product now buy it. And you're just shoving it down their throat. That's not necessarily going to work every time, right? Now, I would also say focus on providing value and enhancing your audience's social currency. Think about the how your content can make your viewers feel smarter, more connected, or more culturally attuned. And del- by delivering these content that it the content that enriches their lives and elevates the status among their peers, you're naturally going to increase its share- shareability and reach. I-, I will take this podcast as an example, the the Push Forward podcast. You know, we started the podcast a- about a year ago, and it's and it is sponsored by our parent company, Push Bio, which is you know uh, a company that allows influencers, marketers, entrepreneurs to create short links, create QR codes, bio pay, bio link pages, all that good stuff. And so it's like ten tools into one. We rarely mention the company. Our goal on the podcast, and again, it's us eating our own dog food here. When I'm sharing this stuff with you, I'm telling it to you because we are also going through the same sorts of of challenges and the journey of saying, hey, I'm going to take time to create really valuable content that is backed up by data. Nothing is hearsay. And I'm going to do it intentionally and with no expectation of a transaction or a sale. It's simply saying, I want my voice to be heard and I want to add value to people's lives. And then once I add value, I hope that you as a listener on the other end, you feel more empowered. And then that in turn will inspire you to learn more about who is behind the Push Forward podcast. And then 
at some point we may work together, but it's not the initial goal. So it's very, very top of the funnel awareness and you're with us and we're not charging anything for the service. It is just part of what we do that makes us better than our competitors. Now that brings us to the end of today's episode of the Push Forward Podcast, but I hope that you've gained valuable insights into the psychology somewhat. I didn't go really deep into the site, you know, the, the psychological aspects, because then we have to go into consumer behaviors and, you know, um, uh, behavioral economics. There's a lot of other moving parts and really hardcore data that is more visual, like uh, one platform that I would definitely recommend for you to look at is Rival IQ because you can really get deep into the analysis of every social media platform and then look at what types of posts and hashtags and is it is it a carousel versus a, a, a video versus a picture? The, does it should it have links, short form, long form? You can really get deep into the 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 analysis of the the subject matter or vertical that you're in. But I hope that you will be able to apply some of these principles to your own content strategy. And remember, whether you're aiming to entertain, educate, or as we'd call it, edutainment, that's what we call it. And and also you should shoot for inspiring people. You know, the key to going viral lies in the understanding of the hearts and minds of your audience. And so we don't pretend to know exactly what's in the hearts of, of, of you all who are listening to us, but the ones who do connect with us, we are picking your brain and really wanting to understand what you want us to uh, bring to the table week in, week out. So until next time, keep pushing forward and crafting content that sparks joy, ignites conversations, and leaves a lasting impact. 